Well, we'll wait for your wife to come back. All righty, let's go ahead and get rolling here. It's a minute or so late, but close enough for us. Well, thanks, Kevin. I thought you were leaving also. Say you're just shutting the door in front of Sarah. And then we're waiting for Christy to find her seat. And it's like herding cats. Man. All right. Can we pray now? Oh, well, we'll wait for Sophie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't talk back. Well, they do. All right. Let's go ahead and pray and get this rolling. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come this evening asking, Lord, your favor again. Praying, Lord, that you would shine your grace upon us. That, Lord, that you would help us to understand sometimes complex matters. But, Lord, all things related to who you are and, Lord, what you've revealed about yourself to us. Help us, Lord, to see. Help us, Lord, to understand. And, Lord, help us to respond in faith and in worship. Pray, Lord, you be with us tonight as we move forward, as we think again about doctrines and, Lord, we pray that in it all that we please you with our attempts and our efforts. And it's for all this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, George and Cindy, come on down. Oh, so you thought we were still on time when you pulled up. Sucker. <laughs> Hi, Roxanne. Well, you know, I was three minutes ago when you were getting out of your car. <laughs> on delay, or undelay, undelay would be the other side. But it's all good, you know. Debbie doesn't take notes on the prayer, so we figured it. If you're ready, we'll just repeat it for you, okay? No. Well, all right then. So, we are moving forward slowly but surely as we try to make some progress here this fall, thinking about doctrines. If you remember last Sunday night, I mentioned what the long-term plan is, thinking not just weeks ahead, but we can, thinking two years ahead in one sense, that we're going to do this doctrine, then we're going to do the doctrine of Christ, then the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and then sometime 2023, 2024, get around to the doctrine of the Trinity as a whole. I want to touch on that a little bit tonight because you can't even really begin to discuss God without getting into some level of discussion about the Trinity. And so I want to start thinking about that a little bit. And then when we do it again in a year and a half or so, we'll do it at much greater depth as we proceed through it. As you're looking at the handout, those of you who've got it, you'll notice there the header under God is three, this idea of picking theological fights. Some of you have heard this discussion before. Some of you, this is new. But I always tell people, it's fun when you get the opportunity to teach people how to pick a fight. Because the problem is most people pick fights. They just don't do it well. They either pick fights that they can't win, or they pick fights they already know the outcome. They just pick it for the sake of picking it. But when we think about doctrines, when we think about theology, we've got to think about how to do it wisely. You know, contrary to popular modern Christianity in America that says, judge not lest you be judged, so we don't judge anything, the Bible does tell us to judge, to discern, to test the spirits, and so forth. Problem is, as so often is the case in many doctrines, we don't teach our people how to do that. And so what you end up with is a whole lot of I thinks and, well, that's your opinion. Well, no, what does Scripture say? It doesn't matter what you think. It's what does God think? What is it revealed to us? And so what we're thinking about for a little bit tonight is how to pick a fight, how to pick this one and not to pick another one, how to recognize which ones are worth having, which ones are worth discussing, which ones you ought to get strong about, and which ones you ought to go, you know what, nah, not today, and walk away. And so we're talking about doing what Al Mohler, president of Southern Seminary, said probably 20 years ago, I guess now, what he called theological triage. I like that idea, so I've kind of adopted it, and then I've adapted his method to kind of fit 
my own concerns and thoughts along the way. But if you think about it, theological triage, theological part's easy. Triage, we're thinking about that word, think medically, think, you know, ER, you know, think all the TV shows you've ever seen with doctors and hospitals. Triage is what you do when a bunch of victims or casualties come in and you sort through them. Which ones do we deal with now? Which ones do we deal with later? And which ones aren't worth the trouble at all? And so as we think about theological triage, we're asking, what's the most important? What must be dealt with? And what can we ignore or agree to disagree? And so trying to think through, how do you sort these theological victims, if you will? How do you recognize which ones really matter the most? And so what Moeller did is he broke everything, big picture, down to three categories, what I call tiers, where he and I draw some lines aren't quite exactly the same, but I think we follow the same gist as one another. Not that he's following me, but you get, the, you get my point. But there are three tiers of issues, some that are worth, some that we might, and some just don't worry about type of things. And so first one is, what are those tier one issues? Tier one issues are doctrinal discussions that ultimately separate real Christians, true Christians, if you like that word better, from non-Christians. These are those that you get right, you go to heaven. You get them wrong, you don't. And so these are the ones that sometimes distinguish the reality between those who are Christians and those who are heretics, or those who claim to be Christians and who are not. And as we think about these kind of issues, the way to help you remember this is tier one issues are those that are non-negotiable. These are not up for discussion and debate. These are things, if you study the Bible closely, these are the things that are crystal clear. They're black and white. There is no gray area. There's no fuzzy space. These are the ones you're going, man, the Bible talks about that a lot. And the answer is yes. I mean, have you noticed that in your Bible reading, there are some things that keep coming up book after book over and over, and yet there are other things that maybe he's mentioned once and it goes away? Invariably, we as Christians tend to fight about those things rather than the ones that are crystal clear. And part of the reason is we assume everybody knows what the crystal clear ones are and what, they don't need to talk about them. Problem is, these are the ones the Bible chooses to talk about most. And thus, so should we. There are a number of things that fit into this category. Just give you a few examples, two examples there, but we can talk about a lot more. The deity of Jesus. Is Jesus fully God or not? Yes or no? That distinguishes us from Mormons or from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Those nice little people who come to your door and try to share their faith with you deny the deity of Jesus in various ways, but they do it. There are those in the churches this morning, up and down this road, who gather for church, who dress nice on Sunday morning, who deny the deity of Jesus. If you go downtown to the Unitarian Church, it's one of the most beautiful church buildings in the city. If you're ever downtown, taking a walk, taking a tour downtown, go by the Unitarian Church and go inside and see it. It's beautiful. They, in essence, I won't say stole it from the denomination they were part of, they voted themselves out of the denomination they were part of. And on any given Sunday down there, you might have a, air quote, Christian preaching who denies the Trinity. You might have a Muslim preaching about unity. You might have a Mormon. You might have an atheist. Basically, it's a really nice fellowship. But we're not sure what they're fellowshipping around. Deity of Christ is tier one, non-negotiable. Same thing with sinfulness of man. We'd go, well, who would deny the sinfulness of man? Well, most of us probably would not do it outright, but you all know people who do it in shades of degree, all right? We're not that bad. Or what they'll do is they'll go some route around the sinfulness of man that they'll say we're sinful, yet somehow we're capable of saving ourselves with good works. And so while they're not denying the sinfulness of man, they're denying the effects of sinfulness in man. And what they've done is changed the doctrine of salvation. And so as you think about what are tier one issues, 
Think most clearly about those that are straight up, plainly connected to the doctrine of salvation. Now, things that might not seem like they are, but are, like doctrine of Scripture, right? How do we know about who God is? But those that are most directly connected to salvation. And of course, as you read Scripture, big picture, the main goal of the Bible is to introduce you to who God is, to reveal Him so that you might relate to Him. But because we are sinful, the rest of Scripture, starting in chapter 3 of Genesis, is about how God's going to work to save us. And those are why these issues keep coming up book after book, chapter after chapter. So tier one issues separate believers from non-believers, those who one day will be in heaven and those who aren't. Tier two issues might seem like they're big issues, but they are, again, by degrees, different. Tier two issues separate Christians from other Christians. What I mean is, these are the ones that separate us into denominations or movements, if you like that statement better. This is why we have Lutherans and Disciples of Christ and Baptists and this group and that group. You know, a lot of people get all up in arms and go, well, if Christianity is true, why are there so many different denominations? Christ prayed for unity. True. But I tell them, I take it as a sign of encouragement that so many folks look at Scripture and see things, some that are so important that they're willing to separate over them. Now, this is not to say people in other denominations aren't Christians. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is we differ on some doctrines that are important enough to us that we differ on them. I, I tell people oftentimes, you know, unapologetically at school, I am a Baptist for a reason. It's not because I was born a Baptist. My mother was saved when I was 12 in a Presbyterian church. And we quickly joined a Baptist church within a year or so after that. But as an adult, we had walked away from Baptist life and eventually came back. I'm a Baptist for a reason. If I lived in a town where the only Bible-believing church was a Presbyterian church, I'd go to the Presbyterian church. But I would never join it because there are things of significant difference that I'm going to go, you know what? By joining it, I don't want to accidentally affirm all that you say and do. But we can fellowship together. We can worship together. We can cooperate. So these are the kind of issues we're talking about here. Normally, these are things that are practical matters, things that are a little more pragmatic, not pragmatic like, oh, we have to have Sunday school and not small groups, but practical matters. Perfect examples would be the doctrine related to baptism. Unless you believe, as some Christian groups do, that you must be baptized to be saved, the Disciples of Christ movement and a few others, the Church of Christ, particular wings of it, believe you have to be baptized to be saved. That makes it a tier one issue. But others, do you baptize by sprinkler and do you baptize by immersion? I think we can agree to disagree, go our separate ways there. I think that some of our brethren in other denominations are wrong about what they do with baptism. Again, I'm a Baptist for a reason. You know, when students come to me, Dr. Beck, I'm trying to figure out my life and, you know, I'm starting to wonder if I was really saved when I was 12 or 6 or 8 or 10 or whatever. And then the question always becomes, should I be rebaptized? And for some who grew up in denominations where baptism is taken lightly, the answer is, yeah, I'll rebaptize you tomorrow. And what I think surprises many of my students in those cases is, generally I tell them, no, you don't need to. But when we do rebaptize, we do so with great seriousness and significance, right? Some of you are here about, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago? Prime example, sitting out at the desk next to Wynn. Saved as a child or as a youth. Quote, then saved as a college student. Then realized that, you know what? I probably wasn't saved then. We rebaptized him because he was convinced that he had come to saving faith later and he wanted to pronounce it to you all publicly. But the people who don't function that way, I don't think are necessarily going to hell. I think they're living in a small measure of error. And if they ask me, I'll tell them, and we'll walk through it. Or women preachers. I think churches that do it are in the wrong. We were at lunch today, and there's a, two older couples, which is really funny for me to say at this point in my life, you know, they were older couples. <laughs> they were experienced adults, Rick. <laughs> They've got a little mileage on the radials. And I was trying not to eavesdrop, but I'm situationally aware, Melanie will tell you, 
and they were talking about somebody who was an, such an anointed preacher, and they were going on and on. So I was kind of, and then she's such a blessing. As I read scripture, you can't be anointed to do something God says don't do. And I think in the case of women preachers, that one's a clear one. There are lots of things women can do. There are lots of things men force women to do at church because we won't do it. Because we're sluggers and slackers. But in terms of this, if I'm in a church and all of a sudden they stand up and introduce Mr. and Mrs. Pastor and he gives her the pulpit, I'm going to politely excuse myself. Whereas if they get up and they explain baptism, I'm going, no, no, I'm going to stay through it. This is a question of what distinguishes us from one group to another. It's not about salvation. No one's going to hell for being an anointed female preacher. But it's significant enough, important enough to me that I won't go there. And somebody goes, well, that's kind of narrow-minded. Um, hello. If they go to that church, guess what they've also chosen to do? To separate from me. We all do it. Everybody does. It's not narrow-minded. It's you trying to be careful and discerning when it comes to the Bible. And so tier two issues, not directly related to salvation, things that are big enough that we choose to separate, but not so big that we're going to condemn one another ultimately for it. Then there are tier three issues. These are doctrines that separate one Christian from another. In other words, these are things that in our church, people disagree. How would you do this? How, what do you think about that? You have your opinion. Hopefully it's biblically driven, not just opinion or preference. But you have a conviction. I think this is what the Bible says about this. And I think you're wrong. But we can worship together. I mean, when you sit, how many ever people were in our sanctuary this morning together, I guarantee, right, we're Baptists. If there are 100 different people in the room, we got 300 different opinions on everything. But we agree to disagree, to borrow language from John Wesley in regards to his one-time friend George Whitfield. These are matters of personal conviction. These are the ones that Scripture doesn't talk about as much. Or these are the ones that maybe the Bible does talk about a lot, but it doesn't necessarily explain them to us. Lays them out there, says, here you are, accept it, and then moves on. And so we're left arm wrestling over some of these issues. A couple of examples here. The timing of the second coming. Is Jesus coming before the rapture or after the rapture? Is there a rapture? Is it a literal millennium or is it a figure of speech millennium? Will it be before this or after that event? Hopefully, after going through Mark chapter 13 a couple weeks ago, you're a little less dogmatic on some of this than we were before. It's not that it's unimportant, but it is such that if Jesus didn't know, what are the odds you're going to have it figured out perfectly? Same thing with the doctrine of election. The Bible clearly teaches the doctrine of election. Undeniable. The word predestined is in the New Testament 13 times. That's 13 times more than the word trinity. So it's there. But the Bible is also clear that you're accountable for what you do and don't do, as we saw this morning with Judas, right? You're going as predicted, but I wouldn't want to be you at the judgment. It's both and, not either or, which is, by the way, how the New Testament and Old Testament often work. The way of thinking in the ancient Near East, and they are Near Easterners, they're not Middle Easterners, they're Near East, they think like Eastern people, they gladly, willingly accept what we would think is a paradox or a contradiction. You ask them, is it A or B, and they'll go, true. It's what Scripture does. This is why some of you know I've adopted as my, probably my personal theme verse, Deuteronomy 29, 29, what's it say? The secret things, meaning God doesn't tell us everything. He lays it out there and says, deal with it. Secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that have been revealed, the things that are clear, belong to us and our children that we might obey them forever. So tier three issues, we can agree to disagree and laugh about it. We can noodle each other and build digs in, 
You know, some of you have grown up in states, South Carolina is such a case, when we live in Kentucky, it was such a case, that it wasn't uncommon to see somebody in the parking lot of church with a house divided license plate. Clemson and Carolina, which one are you? And somebody in the family is one and somebody in the family is the other. Kentucky, it's Louisville versus UK. Seems like every state probably has some equivalent of that. It's funny, I've known husbands and wives who are theologically different on tier three issues. And you know what? It didn't ruin their marriage. That's tier three type stuff. Then you go, Pastor, I think I disagree with you on that. And I go, okay. You know, I'll give you my opinion and then walk away. Now, not everybody agrees. I had an older guy in my church, Rick, experienced adult. Except back then, that was 20 years ago. He was older at that point. But, you know, one day he came up to me, hey, Pastor, what do you think about X? And he was trying to pick a fight before worship. Do you believe such and such? And my answer is, yeah, it's in the Bible. Why don't you? And walked away. Because I knew what he wanted. He wanted to fight about a third tier issue because he had been listening to or watching some guy on TV. Another day, he did the same thing between Sunday school and worship. Pastor, do you believe X about the second coming? And I was honest. He asked. I said, I used to, but I don't anymore. I've changed my view on that a little bit. And his response to me was, well, then how can you say you believe the Bible? And I looked at him and said, well, then how can you sit and listen to my sermon? One of us needs to go. We tend to make the third tier issues the ones we fight the hardest about. And we tend to ignore the big ones. Either because we assume, because we're not talking about it, we must be in agreement, or we don't want to be that divisive which is funny in a world where churches divide over the color of carpet. And so we need to think what issues are worth pushing back on hard and which ones you kind of go, yeah, you're wrong, but whatever, and walk away. At the end of the discussion, this is our transition to our topic tonight, the doctrine of the Trinity is tier one. This is what makes Christianity different from our close cousins. Think about it. What world religion are we almost in lockstep agreement with? Judaism, right? I mean, our Messiah was a Jew. That's why it's ironic how often in Christian's history we've been against Jewish people when we follow a Jewish master. But Jews deny the Trinity. It's fighting words for them. They would call you the heretic for believing in it, that. Or our near cousins, Islam, which is closely related. They claim to descend from Abraham. I would go further and argue, hand over the microphone, that much of what Muhammad wrote in the late 600s, he got from Judaism and Christianity. He mixed the two together with some other stuff he was familiar with and came up with this new thing. But there's a lot of similarity, especially in the Jewish portion of it. It's Middle Eastern but they deny the deity of Jesus. And thus, we need to evangelize our Jewish friends and neighbors. We need to talk to our Muslim co-workers. Hey, did you know? And let's think about this a little bit. And we go, oh, we don't want to do that. Jewish people, not so much. Muslims have no problem talking about their faith and how you're different. And I don't mean the ones who are violent about it. That's, you know, the very small minority. If they're devout, they're willing to defend their beliefs. Tier one, doctrine of the Trinity. And so, think about how to put together a biblical theology of the Trinity. As I said earlier, the word Trinity does not occur in the Bible. Can't find it. Not there. In fact, the word Trinity was created by a guy named Tertullian, who was trying to figure out how to talk about the Trinity when he didn't have a vocabulary for it. So he said, well, there's this trinity, this three thing. So the word trinity is not there. However, the triunity, there's a new word also. Isn't it neat? Theologians, we come up with words. That's how you get a PhD, is you create a word no one's ever used before. The triunity, the idea that there is a triune God is in the Bible. And you find it all over the place. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of what? Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Treats three different beings as equal. If you're going to baptize somebody in the name of all three, you're saying all three are the same in terms of value and worth. Or you'll find places in Paul's writings where he talks about we're praying to God the Father, we're talking about the work of the Son, and we're hoping the Spirit will do it for you. And so the triunity of God is all over the place, arguably even in the Old Testament. Now, sometimes we run the risk of reading into a text in the Old Testament and go, well, that's a trinity. It's not clear it's a trinity. We can say it is because we're reading it from the benefit of 65 other books. Moses' audience would not have heard trinity, but they were to heard plurality. In fact, the word Elohim, the word translated God, is plural, not singular. And thus, even the text in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, fits that notion. Now, we know from other biblical texts there's more there, but the idea of the triune God, that there is a Godhead, there is at least more than one, two, three, and that they're all equal throughout scripture so you don't need to find here's the word trinity you don't need to it's there anyway for christians who find themselves having to defend the doctrine of the trinity to their jewish neighbors or to their philosophical skeptical friends well that word you know you all believe in a trinity that's not the bible you need to learn to find it and show it to them there's lots of places where all three are mentioned in the same sentence as equals separate but equal. They're doing things together, but individually. So let's think about it for a while. Think about the Trinity in the Old Testament. Answer is, as I just said a moment ago, it is there, but the picture is incomplete. As we're going through the book of Hebrews, think back to when we started Hebrews, what, last, maybe about a year ago. When we open the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and following. In times past, God spoke in various ways through various people. But today, he's spoken most perfectly and clearly through Jesus. The Bible admits that no book stands alone, that it's building upon assumptions, teachings, already started giving more detail. Even the covenant between God and Abraham plays that way. When you read Genesis chapter 12, when God first comes to Abraham, what does he tell Abram? Go and I'll show you. Chapter 15, God comes back into conversation with Abram. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. But your son, your child, is going to make the difference. And then he comes back in 17 and says, so many you can't count, and... I'm going to give you a land that will belong to them forever. It's not three different covenants between God and Abram. It's what? Building on what they can handle step by step. And so when we see the Trinity in the Old Testament, it's not all there as in here's the Father, here's the Son, here's the Holy Spirit doing something. But when you read, you sense something's going on here. You've got the angel of the Lord so often speaking, and all of a sudden somebody goes, oh, wait a minute, that was God, wasn't it? Think about Moses at the burning bush. Moses sees the thing, it's on fire, but it's not burning. When you live in a world where a wildfire is a problem, because it's going to destroy all your food sources for your animals, it catches your attention. But when it doesn't burn it up, so Moses goes, gets close to the burning bush, and what does he hear? Cecil B. DeMille. Moses, take off your shoes. Why? Why? You're standing on holy ground. Where's holy ground? Wherever God is. But when the bush starts talking, Moses, the author, introduces it as it, the angel of the Lord said. Yet Moses knows it's not an angel because he says, if I go back and they ask me who sent me, who should I say? And what was the answer? Tell them I am sent you. And it switches In the rest of the story, Moses, the author, is clear. It's God speaking. 
But there are other places where there's this distinction between the angel of the Lord and God. Or Genesis 1, God created, but his spirit is hovering over the water. And so you get hints and shadows of these things in multiple places. Key text, of course, I've already hinted at, so let's think about it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I would argue day 6 is the most important day in the creation story. That Moses talks about day 6 more than any other day of the 6. Literally talks about it more than any other day. At length he talks about it. The rest of the Bible talks about day 6 more than any other day. Jonah, when they ask him, which God do you worship? Jonah says, I worship the God of Israel, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He's taking us to Genesis. When the angels and the crowd and the witnesses are worshiping God in Revelation 4, they're singing God a new song, new song. And what do they acknowledge? He's worthy of worship, honor, and praise. Why? Because he's the maker of the heavens and the earth. Go read the Psalms. How many of the Psalms talk about God and creation? So day six is the most important day, clearly. Why? Because on day six, he made man. And what makes man special is not our ability to think, because some of us don't do that real well. We nearly clocked a motorcycle on the way home from church this afternoon because a guy who stalled going through an intersection decided the next intersection to try to rabbit jump me and jump into my lane while narrowly avoiding the car in front of him. I honk, he doesn't even flinch, probably because his heart's going up and going. Charleston drivers prove the ability to think is not necessarily endemic to humanity. What makes humans special is Genesis 1, when God says, let us make man in our image. And it is God who is speaking. But to that point in the text, there is no us. When Moses says it, it's probably a sermon first, and he wrote it down. When he says it, that's the first time there is a dialogue going on, so to speak, in Scripture. Up to that point, God said, let there be, and there was. Now God is speaking to somebody else who has not been introduced yet. Unless, verse 1, and 2, and 3, when it talks about the Spirit of God hovered over the waters, is already making the distinction that there's God and then there's the Spirit of God. But lots of folks go, see, that's the Trinity. And lots of other folks say, no, that's not the Trinity at all in that verse, in that word six, or us, sorry, in verse 26. And they'll try to explain it away. They'll look at verse 26 and see the let us, and they'll explain it away first by arguing it's the plural of majesty. Plural of majesty. Some of you go, what's that? Watched enough movies with kings and queens. You've heard it. It's when the king or the, the royal person refers to himself or herself in the plural. We will have our lunch now. And they choose that language to suggest, I am far more valuable than you. There's a you and then there's an us. That's the plural of majesty. In all of the Bible, there might be one place where God refers to himself in that way. And that passage is up for debate also. My take is, that's not what he's doing here. So you go, okay, so then who's talking? So others will say, well, God is talking to the angels. Two problems with that. First of all, in the first 25 verses of the Bible, have we been introduced to angels yet? No, we don't get introduced to angels till later in Genesis. Moses brings them up, drops them on your lap, and moves on without explaining them either. But at this point, there are no angels. And so for you to go, oh, he's talking to angels, is reading back into the text also. Plus, there's a very significant theological problem with that argument, besides the fact that he's not introduced angels yet. Let us make man, how? How? In our, plural again, image. Do God and angels share a common image? No. Are humans created in the image of angels? No. That can't be the answer either. So the us has to be something else. And the answer is, it's the first veiled reference to the Trinity. 
not in full expression, not fully explained, but we have an Elohim, a God, described in the plural. We've got a spirit of God, and we've got this notion that we're created in the image of God, whatever that is. And then the rest of the Bible is explaining why that's so important. Why is God saving humans? Because we're the only image bearers. He sees value in us because he sees himself in us. And of course, jump in the New Testament, the doctrine of sanctification, what's God doing? Making us like Jesus, who is the perfect image of the invisible God, which helps us then fulfill the command in Leviticus 20 and in 1 Peter, be holy because God is holy. So the Trinity is working in the creation. Moses doesn't explain it, but he introduces the discussion and is worth following. Obviously, it gets easier when we get to the New Testament. The Trinity is in the New Testament. What was hinted at, given in shadows, I mean, going through Hebrews, we talk about this all the time now, what was hinted at in the Old Testament, explained in the New. This is what's referred to as the doctrine of progressive revelation. Now, some people cringe a little bit when you say that because they think what you're saying is, oh, Genesis was insufficient. No, Genesis was the launching point and the next book added to it, right? Funny, the very person I'm thinking of in my mind who would tell you, oh, I don't like that word progressive revelation because it sounds like Genesis isn't enough, believes the fifth book is more important than Genesis. So what you're saying is, without your fifth book, Genesis makes no sense. Yeah, no, and then he backs off and changes his wording a little bit. Progressive revelation doesn't imply the Old Testament is bad. It's saying that each step gives us more of the information we need ultimately, right? We're not told who the Messiah is in Genesis. We're told one thing to look for in the Messiah. Look for a son of Eve. We have to get to Exodus to look for a Messiah to who's a deliverer. We have to get to Leviticus to look for a Messiah who's a priest. We have to get to second, or first and second Samuel to see that the Messiah is a king. All those things are true. But it's all together that we see the complete true picture. But a great text for us to think about, New Testament, would be Matthew 3. So if you've got your Bible, I know none of you got this one memorized. Go ahead and open your Bible, Matthew 3. story of Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke. Some of you are going to go, oh, I know what this story is, as soon as you look down at verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, and I love that phrase, behold, a voice. <laughs> he says, look, do you hear that? It's intentional. It's meant to make you go, what, what, did he just mix metaphors? Behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You've got what? All three persons of the Trinity in one place at one time as three persons. You've got Jesus there, who is announced as the son of God there. And the proof is visible as well as audible because you've got the spirit of God there. And so early on, it's clear the gospel writers want us to wrestle with the notion of a trinity. Of course, the other biblical text we've already mentioned, so I won't dwell long here, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, the Great Commission, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, treating them all as equals. This is where you get into problem with, you got some people who go, well, I baptize according to the book of Acts. Some of you go, What? Shut up. Don't listen to Siri. She can take you astray. But some will argue that in Matthew, or in Matthew, in the book of Acts, it says the baptism in the name of Jesus. And so they're trying to pit Scripture against Scripture. As though somehow Acts is more important than the book of Matthew. And the ones who often do that, by the way, are the ones who want to talk about speaking in tongues because that's in the book of Acts. 
So they give Acts primacy over the Gospels. Instead of going, how do we reconcile these two different texts? And the answer is easy, ultimately. Baptizing in the name of Jesus and Acts is just shorthand for what? Baptizing in the name of the Trinity. Jesus is the representative there. He's not telling you to baptize different than Matthew's telling you to baptize. He's telling you the story is what they do with those people like Cornelius. They baptize them ASAP. Next, how they baptize them like God commands in the Great Commission. But the baptism treats us all or them all as equals as well. And so it's there in the gospel accounts from the beginning of Matthew to the end of Matthew. And then shows up, of course, all over the place in Paul's writings, in the general epistles, in the book of Revelation, over and over. If you just look, the authors have it on every page, it seems like, without ever using the word Trinity. So it's there. Now the question becomes, how do we talk about it? How do we put all this together in such a way that's understandable, communicable, meaning we can tell other people about it without confusing them utterly? Well, here's the caveat before we try to do this. We are now trying to describe the indescribable. Right? When you talk about something that takes your breath away, it means you can't talk about it. Because what do you need to talk? Breath. Now we're trying to describe the indescribable. We're trying to put in words things that are beyond words. We're trying to deal with something God himself acknowledges because he reveals himself in part, but then when he sends Jesus, he reveals himself in whole. He has to condescend, to use language of the Puritans, to come down to our level so he can begin to understand what's going on. But of course, when Jesus talks about these kind of things, think about the book of John chapter 6, when he gets done talking about how the son must die, The crowds walk away going, who can understand these things? They're too hard. The Trinity is one of those. We have to be really, really careful here. We can use language, but the language only goes so far. If we try to get into analogies, typically we go too far. So let's talk about the theological language here first. We need to talk about the fact that God, the Godhead, is three persons. There is a Father, there is a Son, there is a Holy Spirit. They are separate. Any other description becomes heresy. And we'll talk about maybe one or two of those here in a moment. If God is one in three persons, what you then have to acknowledge is that all three persons are co-equal. Meaning, truly equal, that they all share equal billing, if you want to think of it that way, or equal value or worth. So there are three, total equality, who are functioning individually. Jesus does this, Holy Spirit does that, God is over here doing something else. They're all functioning individually. That's why we got to have three. Think of the story at the baptism. Who came up out of the water? Jesus. Who came down? Spirit. Who spoke? God. Three very distinct beings, all functioning individually, yet doing so corporately, working together. I'll come back to a very practical application of that idea in a little bit. And so it is one in three, co-equal. We also have to be careful to make sure we explain that each one of them is fully God. Completely God. Not sort of God, not, you know, God in diminished capacity. God's at 100%. Jesus is about 80. Spirit, he's over here at 20. No, they're all fully God. Whatever it is that makes one God, they all have it. Theologians start talking about something we don't talk about in Sunday school much. We start talking about God and the Spirit and the Son being consubstantial. And you're going, "Ah, I've never used that word in my life. There's a good reason you haven't, because nobody would know what you're talking about. 
So let's break it down here. The prefix, con, means with. Concurrent. Concomital. They're all concurrent. They're all there at the same time. Con means with. Substantial, here's where you get tripped up. The word substantial here does not mean what you would mean if you said that's substantial. Oh, there was a typhoon in Taiwan, or the, you know, they had the mass, massive waves hit parts of Alaska yesterday, 54-foot waves at sea. Substantial damage, you mean heavy or significant. Substantial here is a Greek philosophical term. So now you got to think Plato, Aristotle. Actually, it comes directly from Aristotle's explanation. But the word substantial comes from a Greek word substance, not substance. A substance would be what you put in your soup. Substance, S-T-A-N-S at the end, it means essence. They share the same essence. Whatever it is that makes God God, they all three have it in full measure. They have the same essence. Versus, another category coming from Aristotle, accidents, not accident, accidents. Accidents are the physical manifestations of something. Let me give you an illustration real quick. I'm standing at some of you. You're at the pulpit. Puritans, Spurgeon, others would call this the desk. This is the sacred desk. But just leave it for the moment like a pulpit. You all been in enough churches. Do all pulpits look the same? You've seen big ones. You've seen little ones. You've seen them in the Presbyterian churches up in the air. You've seen the fancy ones with the little sounding board, the little dome over it to reflect sound. You've seen the little fiberglass ones. You've seen the little metal ones that look like construction sites. They all look different. Their accidents are all different. Yet you know every one of them is a pulpit, even though they don't look anything alike. Because, in essence, they are the same. What is it that makes a pulpit a pulpit? It's a, stall, a tall, standing desk, basically. It has a flat surface to hold the Bible. It holds a key place in the worship experience and where it is on the stage. That's why in Baptist world, ours is in the middle of the stage. In Catholic world, it's on the side. And their theology, what's said, is less significant than what happens at the altar with the Mass. That's a theological statement where you put it. That's why we have a pulpit here all the time. That's why I don't like churches where they take the pulpit away for the worship, and then you close your eyes and you miraculously appear, and there it is. But the essence of a pulpit is the same no matter what it looks like. Out in the parking lot. There's probably 25 different types of cars and SUVs. But we all know they're still cars or SUVs. They share the same essence. What makes a car a car is out there in one form or other. So whatever it is that makes God God, all three persons in the Trinity have an equal measure. And so we've got to talk about co-equal. They're all worthy of our worship. Consubstantial, they all share the same essence. And at the end of the day, we also have to remain clear that we're talking about one God. You go, well, how's that? Well, what we're driving at when we talk about this is what else is part of the nature of when you talk about something is God? What makes it God? It's the ultimate being, right? Any religion that has a God has an ultimate being. There's the irony, of course, that some religions have multiple gods. Some of your neighbors have coexist bumper stickers. Oh, well, they're all the same. Well, by definition, you can't be God and share your godness or equality with all these other would-be gods. One's God, the other ones aren't, or none of them are God. But there's one God here because they share all this. It is a community thing, if you will, a collective. But there's also, thinking back Genesis, they also share this feature. They're co-eternal. They are co-eternal. What I mean is that all three persons have always existed. There was not a time when only the God the Father existed. By nature, if you talk about God the Father, what must exist? The Son. 
if the two are going to communicate, there must be a way for them to communicate. Augustine argues that's the role of the Spirit. I think he gets in a little trouble with some of his arguments, but the point is there's never a time when Jesus wasn't. Unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is not a created being. Unlike the Mormons, Jesus is not a God who had a start. By definition, if you are a God, you've always been a God. And so there are three. They are co-equal, equally God. They are consubstantial, all the same essence, and they've all always existed. One in three, three in one. And there's a bunch of other cons and co's, but you get the gist. You need to go home and let it kind of settle for a while to ruminate, to let it ferment and then see what kind of heresy you can create. So let me warn you of some heresies that have been created by people trying to figure out how to explain the unexplainable. I tell my students all the time in church history, there are no intentional heretics in church history. They all got there accidentally. Normally because they went beyond what scripture itself describes. And so there are a number throughout history, especially in the early, early days, that are connected to the doctrine of the Trinity. One of the earliest is one called Arianism. We're talking the early 300s. Christianity is 250 years old or so. There have been other errors related to Trinity already. One guy claimed to be the Holy Spirit and a few other odds and ends, but Arius is the first significant challenge to the doctrine of the Trinity. Everybody assumed it. They've been talking about Jesus being worthy of worship for a long time. Now, they had some debates and some struggles along the way, but they're already there, thinking about Jesus as deity. Well, Arius says, thinking my argument earlier, Arius says he can't be God if there's more than one. How can you have God as king if there's another one who's also king? If you end up with a kingdom with two kings, what do you end up with? Civil war. You end up with two kingdoms. So Arius is going... Logically, this can't be. How do we keep Jesus worthy of our worship, but not in competition with God, so to speak? So Arius taught that Jesus was the greatest of all of God's creation. He argued there was a time when there was no God, Jesus. When God made him, he then used Jesus to make everything else. Thus, He's looking at John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Worthy of our worships, how Arius would read it. And then he also is allowed then to maintain later on, down in verse 4, that whatever's been made was made by Jesus. So Jesus is powerful. He's mighty. He's unlike any other human. But he's not like God exactly. So he's worthy of our worship as the greatest of all God's creation. But he doesn't compete with God. And so essentially what he does is he denies the deity of Jesus. He keeps him worthy of our affection and our respect, our love. But he is not deity. Lots of modern day examples still doing that. I've already mentioned them, so we'll just throw them out here real quick. Jehovah's Witnesses. They teach what's called adoptionism. That Jesus was adopted by God, either at the baptism, this one's my son, or some have come along and said that God adopted him at the crucifixion. He was faithful to the end, God rewarded him by adopting him. Or Mormons, who Jesus is a created being, the result of intimate behavior between the God of this planet and one of his wives, which, by the way, so is Lucifer, that they're siblings. Oh, and so, by the way, so are you, if you follow the thought coming out of the Mormon church. So Arianism, one of the earliest. How do we honor God? How do we honor Jesus without mixing the two up? And so he went where we ought not go. A modern error related to the Trinity is still pretty rampant. It's what's called modalism. It's also originally, in its oldest form, related to this question of how can God be king if there's two or three. Modalism, I think, is the most common Trinitarian problem in the modern church. 
What this view teaches, and some of you are going to start cringing in a second and slinking down into your seats. What this view teaches is that there is one divine being, one that we would call God, who manifests himself in different modes at different times. Now, the earliest modalists back in the 200s, they were clear about this. There's only one God. Sometimes he manifests himself as God the Father. Sometimes he manifests himself as God the Son. Sometimes he manifests himself as God the Holy Spirit. That way you have one God. You have monotheism, right? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you have God showing up at different times in different stories in different modes. Going so far, and here's how close some of us get to this error, that when the Bible talks about Jesus dying on the cross, we go, God died for your sins. How many of you said that statement? God died for your sins. Modalists literally believe God died for your sins. God died on the cross. Not the second person of the Trinity like you would mean, they would say God dies on the cross. And guess what? When your neighbors hear you say that, they don't understand the Trinity. What do they hear you saying? That God died on the cross. Not God the Son, not second person of the Trinity. They hear the maker of the universe died. What kind of God is that? Who can die? Plus, then you have a whole host of other questions theologically, like if God is dead, who's in charge? Welcome to the 1960s, right? God is dead. How long was he dead? Did he wake up immediately in heaven? Or was he dead for three days? And who ran the earth for three days? That's the old form of modalism. The modern form of modalism comes when we all try to explain the Trinity to our children in VBS. And we get into deep, deep water. That's the most common illustration. How do you explain the Trinity? Well, it's like water, you see. What do you mean? Well, water can be liquid. It can be a gas. Or it can be a solid. It can be ice. That's the Trinity. Here's the problem. Unless you're a nuclear physicist, if there's any smart electrons in the room, water can never be all three at one time. Yet the Bible teaches God is God all the time. Jesus is God all the time. Holy Spirit is God all the time. And you've heard other versions. Augustine created one. It's like the sun, S-U-N. They've got the star, his father. You've got the rays. Shut up. You've got the rays. That would be the sun coming to us so we can see the sun. And then you've got the warmth. That's the Holy Spirit touching our lives. I think it's a better illustration of water, but it has a problem still. It still treats them as all they're ultimately only one. And so what happens with modalism is ultimately what this view does is it denies the existence of Christ as a separate being, and it denies the existence of the Holy Spirit as a separate being. Modalism is not a view of the Trinity. And we've got to quit teaching it by accident. It is a mystery. If we think about it, Chris, one of these days we need to play them the uh, Lutheran satire. Have you seen the one about Patrick? That would be worth watching one night. It's humorous and theologically so rich it's not even funny. If you got time this week, Google Lutheran satire. There's a bunch. They, they interact with Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, atheists. But the one about the Trinity is particularly relevant. The point is, there's very precise language, co-eternal, consubstantial. There's a reason we use hard-to-understand concepts, because the easy ones usually lead to error. And so when you talk about the Trinity, we're walking a very fine line between you're okay or you're in the ditch. Real quick application, then we've got to kind of cut this short for time's sake. Real quick, why is this important other than, gee, the Bible talks about it? Well, think about it. Salvation. 
is impossible without the Trinity. Right? God planned salvation. Jesus accomplishes it, right? He's the one who dies on the cross. But it's the Holy Spirit who applies it in our lives. You deny one of the three, salvation becomes impossible. Same thing is true of prayer. We pray to the Father. We pray through the Son. But as Paul talks about in Romans 8, we pray by the Holy Spirit. No prayer without the Trinity. Doesn't matter how many saints you add into the mix, your prayers are going nowhere without the Trinity. And so if all that's true, and all the things we've been just at least touching upon tonight are true, we need to acknowledge at the end of the day, all three are worthy of our worship. Father, Son, and Spirit. That's hard to do. Talk to Chris later about how to pick songs that have all three. And how to do it without making the Holy Spirit more than important than the other two, which some denominations do. Or, because we're Baptists, or like we're afraid of the Holy Spirit, we often leave him out of the equation, as though he doesn't exist. But all three are worthy of our worship. And all three are needed in our worship. And in our Bible study. And in our daily walk. So this is one of those non-negotiable discussions. But it's one that needs to be full of grace. Immature Christians are going to have a hard time explaining something this hard. Because mature Christians have a hard time explaining this one. Because it's that hard. But we need to have the conversation... And when we hear error, we need to graciously correct it because there's fundamental truths connected to it. All right, let's go ahead and pray and then pack it up and get ready for the start of the rest of the week for many of you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening. Lord, as we say all the time, we thank you, Lord, for the place to come to, to be with brothers and sisters, family and friends, to spend time together, Lord, in study and worship, seeking to know who you are better. But also, Lord, doing so because Jesus commanded it. He commanded us to be faithful. He commanded us to profess our faith and repent. He commanded us to be baptized. And he commanded us to make disciples of others. And to do that, Lord, we must learn first what he taught the disciples. And then, Lord, to teach that to others. And so it's our prayer, Lord, through the work of the Spirit tonight, that you would help us grasp that which is hard to grasp. Lord, that you would help us to be able to wrap our minds around something so, so difficult in such a way, Lord, that you would preserve us from error, that the Spirit would lead us to truth, and that by doing so, you would make us more like Jesus, who understood the Trinity, understood who he was and what he came to do, understood why he came to do it for your glory, and understood that to finish the work, he must send the Holy Spirit to apply it in our lives. Lord, tonight we pray for that, that the Spirit would be a work in us, comforting us, and teaching us that it would be, Lord, making us more like Jesus, who in the end promises us that he'll make us like you, not eternal, but holy, that we might spend all of eternity in your presence, fellowshipping with you. It's for all this, Lord, we ask and pray tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.